while walking along a trail. It happened in the area of Etobicoke Creek. Officers say the initial call came in just before 3 o'clock this afternoon. We are continuing to monitor this story and we will bring you more details as we get them. You can also head to our website cbc.ca slash Toronto for updates. To Oakville now where what began as a joyride this morning ended in hospital. Three Oakville teens were rushed to a trauma center after a 13 year old crashed an SUV on the highway. One of those teens remains in critical condition tonight. Talia Ricci takes us to the scene. We know the 13 year old driver was traveling at a high speed down this road, drove through that stop sign, through this fence, which you can see has been replaced by a temporary fence, and crashed into the center median on the QEW. The driver sustained minor injuries. The 16 year old passenger has serious injuries but is in stable condition. A 14 year old in the back seat is in critical condition. All of them were transported to McMaster Children's Hospital. Officers were initially called to the crash scene around 4.45 this morning. The driver had been traveling southbound on 8th line, which runs perpendicular to the QEW, when he lost control of the SUV. Police have confirmed the vehicle belonged to his parents. So far, no charges have been laid. So we need to put together physically what happened at the scene, um, get exact speeds if we can. Uh, how the how the kids ended up in the car, why they were there, what they'd been doing leading up to this point. Um, so, yeah, essentially everything so we can put together what what transpired this morning that's resulted in five youth getting hurt. Now the roads were also clear at that time. Earlier, Halton police said that the results of this crash could have been far worse if it happened just a little while later. They say often transport trucks are traveling on this highway. It could have been. It could have been much worse. Maybe if it was a couple hours later. Uh, it, it is a Saturday morning at 4:45. If it was maybe a weekday during rush hour, it could have been worse. We know the three youth involved are all males from Oakville, but police haven't released any further details, and they're not releasing their names. Earlier, the westbound lanes of the QEW were closed for about four hours, and that caused some congestion earlier. But they have since reopened. Police are now looking for witnesses. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Oakville. A four-year-old child has minor injuries after being hit by a driver in Parkdale this afternoon. The child was struck near McDonnell and Pearson Avenues just before 1 o'clock. Paramedics initially said the child was in serious but stable condition. Police later said the injuries were downgraded to minor after a hospital assessment. Health Minister Jeanette Petipa-Taylor is the latest cabinet minister to speak up about the ongoing SNC-Levelin controversy. I was pleased that uh, Ms. Jody Wilson-Raybould had an opportunity to share uh, her points of view and her story. And uh, I'm looking forward to ensuring that the Justice Committee finishes the investigation that they're doing and also that the Ethics Commissioner will start off doing uh, his good work as well. Former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould testified at testified earlier this week that she was pressured by the Prime Minister's office to intervene in a case against construction giant SNC-Levelin. The Prime Minister is facing opposition demands for a police investigation and a public inquiry. He maintains nothing untoward happened during discussions with Raybould. The Justice Committee, Committee will be sitting next week. They are expected to hear from more witnesses in the affair, including Justin Trudeau's former top political advisor, Gerald Butts. The MP for the riding of Whitby says she won't be seeking re-election this October. MP Selena Caesar Chavan says her decision has been, quote, tremendously difficult. She says she's grateful for the support she's been given by Canadians across the country. In a statement, she clarified that her decision was not related to the testimony of former Justice Minister Wilson Raybould and that she made the decision not to run against again months before the SNC-Lavalin controversy came to light. I think that I've made peace with the fact that I need to have a transplant in order to keep living. Coming up, one woman's fight to get a liver, why she says her only real chance for survival is to find a living donor. That story a little later in our newscast. Well, Mother Nature certainly hasn't been kind to Toronto this year. City officials say we received a year's worth of snow 
in just six weeks. As Hawea Fadal explains, that's forced the city to haul away snow for the first time in almost a decade. It's been a brutal winter for Torontonians this year. Back-to-back -back snowstorms resulted in 43 centimeters of snow in February alone. And with more cold weather on the way, the city says the only option is to physically move the snow. Crews will be working over the next five to seven days, clearing snow off these side streets using snow blowers and dump trucks like this one to move snow to City of Toronto snow storage facilities. The snow will be taken to one of five facilities scattered across the city. This is all to make roads safer for emergency vehicles to pass. For residents in this neighborhood near Young and Davisville, that's welcome news. I actually called 311 to report how dangerous it was. Like one lady got stuck on that snowbank over there and had to call a tow truck to get her car out. All the snow clearing comes at a hefty price. The annual winter budget is $87 million, and so far this year, the city says it's spent $15 million. The city could only provide a broad estimate for this latest blitz. It won't be in the thousands, it may be in the millions. Still, many are wondering why it took so long. It would be nice if it was done sooner, I'm glad they're doing it now. We just assumed, what, it's not in the budget for the city to do these things regularly? I don't know. For this jogger, running on side streets is no easy task. He says he wants the city to step up. It's not Vancouver. Vancouver, I understand. But it's Toronto. I think we should be more diligent about keeping the sidewalks clean. But the city is reminding people to do their part this winter and clear their own property. It's up to the resident or the property owner on every street in the city of Toronto to maintain the sidewalk safe, uh, to make sure it's safe and passable. So far, no vehicles have had to be towed, but the city is asking residents to watch for snow clearing signs and park accordingly. Crews will be out clearing streets 24 hours a day for the next week. Hawaii Fidel, CBC News, Toronto. So I bet you're all wondering if there is more in store for us. So perfect time to bring Sophia in. And that's always the thing that we're wondering. Seems like we're talking about this every weekend, an upcoming snowstorm. I swear I jinxed it. What was it, <laughs> after Christmas or New Year's? I said, when's winter going to show up? Well, it's been it six did. weeks of fun. Yeah, in the last six weeks, we have gotten a year's worth of winter precipitation, the snow, the ice the whole gamut and don't let this first weekend of March and its somewhat seasonal temperatures fool you because it is shaping up to be rather wintry as well. Uh, light scattered flurries still coming down, uh, including for those of you around the GTA could continue into the evening and maybe the overnight period to the tune of two to five centimeters locally. Some heavier pockets doesn't hold the candle at the like midweek winter wallop that we all got. As you heard, still blitzing, trying to clear all of those streets. Fairly seasonal weekend. We do have a little bit more snow potentially to talk about for Sunday. It is mostly a Niagara story though. Big Texas low down to our south, far south in the U.S. Plains. But uh, comes north just far enough to maybe give a couple centimeters to Niagara. Maybe not even shovel worthy. Maybe a few scattered flurries for those of you in the GTA. But really the story for this work week coming up will be that of a national pattern dominated by, yes again, the polar vortex. So we'll talk about the cold to look forward to when we come back. Oh boy. Do we yeah. look forward to that? I don't know. <laughs> 18 more days till spring, folks. 18 more days. Good. Countdown is on. Thanks, <laughs> Sophia. Well, the location has finally been decided. $192 million in funding committed. Next challenge for Ottawa's super library. What should the space look like? The city is putting that question to the public in a series of consultations. We caught up with a few at attendees at one of those meetings today. I would like to see more gathering spaces because more of a community hub. Um, the ability for like immigrants and new Canadians and other people to come come together. Also a meeting space for uh, children and probably like um, uh, design spaces, that kind of thing. Uh, personally, I'd like to see uh, more movies and games, uh, but I know there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of uh, things that you could do at the library that you couldn't do traditionally, like video editing, like uh, 3D printing, a lot of the new technology. A lot of times you get exposed to that first at the library, and uh, I'd like to support that. This is going to be something I think that we could be really proud of in Ottawa and I think it's nice to have people's reflections on what they want to see so it's something that's reflective of the Ottawa community and how we're changing. 
a Toronto woman with a rare liver disease is asking for the public's help. She needs a transplant to survive. She's not sick enough to make it to the top of the list. And when she does, it could be too late. As Natalie Nanowski reports, she hopes to find a living donor. I have a chart review. 12 years of medical records tracking the progress of Susan Redun's rare autoimmune disease. You know, it's uh, anxiety provoking. It's hard to live. It's hard to live your life when you've got this sort of looming over you. The 63-year-old has primary sclerosing cholangitis. Her body's bile ducts back up, eventually killing her liver. There's no cure. I think that I've made peace with the fact that I need to have a transplant. After a decade, she's finally sick enough to make the transplant list, but not sick enough to be moved to the top. And her blood type, O positive, the universal donor, means even if a matching liver comes in, she's unlikely to get it. So in my case, I have a very narrow, I can only receive from an O, and chances are they would go to many other people on the list before me. Susan's best option is a live donor, but no one in her family is a match. Her husband, Joseph Gurr, created a Facebook page looking for one. Uh, you know, what we don't want to do is we want to avoid her health declining to a point where she may not be eligible for any operation. The challenge with a live donor is there's no provincial list, like there is with the Trillium Gift of Life Network, where you can donate your organs when you die. People have to seek out the live donor forms online, like Heather Badenoch did last year. So I decided to become a living liver donor to a stranger because I was struck by the fact that in Ontario, every three days, Someone dies because they don't get the organ that they need. She gave part of her liver to a child and wants to encourage others to donate. Someone out there can give a piece of liver away. Your body knows what to do to make you whole again. And you can save a life. Susan's family is hoping someone with an O-positive liver will do just that. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. Tough to tell from this event, but U.S. President Donald Trump had a challenging week. His former personal lawyer's harsh testimony, a failed North Korean summit. Details on why none of those make difference to this crowd. After the break.
Donald Trump has had a tough week with his former lawyer calling him a con man in testimony before a congressional committee and walking away from his much-hyped North Korea summit with no deal. But today, none of that really seemed to matter. Melissa Kent explains. Please, welcome to the CPAC stage, our president, Donald Trump. Today, Donald Trump got to do what he does best, speak to his base. Right-wing conservatives from across America gathered to watch and listen to the president at the annual CPAC convention in Maryland. We're all in love together. We Trump was looking for that love after a rough week in which he was labeled a racist, a cheat and a con man by his former lawyer and failed to get a deal at his summit with North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un. Every once in a while, you have to walk. He also continued doing damage control over a comment from earlier this week when he said Kim was not responsible for the death of Otto Warmbier, an American university student who died after being imprisoned in North Korea for more than a year. I don't believe that he would have allowed that to happen. That elicited criticism from both sides of the aisle and the Warmbier family, who issued a statement saying, Kim and his evil regime are responsible for the death of our son Otto. No excuses or lavish praise can change that. I'm in such a horrible position because in one way, I have to negotiate. In the other way, I love Mr. and Mrs. Warmbier, and I love Otto. And it's a very, very delicate balance. Trump used the rest of his CPAC platform to speak on issues attractive to his base, border security, trade, immigration, the Second Amendment. For two hours and 24 minutes, he highlighted what he sees as his accomplishments, railed against his opponents, and mocked the Democratic Party. All of us are here today because we know that the future does not belong to those who believe in socialism. Today, an avowed socialist kicked off his campaign for the Democratic nomination. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders is taking his second run at the Oval Office, calling Trump the most dangerous president in modern history. Melissa Kent, CBC News, New York. U.S.-backed forces in Syria say they will soon take the last territory held by ISIS. They say a two-pronged assault began last night. It's believed several hundred ISIS fighters remain in a cluster of hamlets around Bakus. They are deploying drones and rockets in defense. The enclave's capture would end four years of a rebel stronghold straddling Syria and Iraq. Thousands have fled in recent days. The exodus included both civilians and ISIS fighters. At least six civilians are reported killed in the disputed border region of Kashmir after hostilities between India and Pakistan escalated. Indian authorities say a Pakistani airstrike killed a mother and two children when a shell hit their home. Pakistan says three civilians were killed in two separate Indian strikes. It comes just after Pakistan's release of an Indian fighter pilot was prompting hopes tensions might ease. The current standoff was ignited by a February 14th car bombing in Indian-controlled Kashmir. Women's rights defenders arrested in Saudi Arabia will be going on trial. They're accused of undermining the kingdom's security. Human rights groups allege some of the detainees have been tortured. The arrests have escalated tensions between Saudi Arabia and Canada. Lorenda Redekop has more on what could come next and the Canadian connections. This is Lujain al Hafloul, one of the people being held. She graduated from the University of British Columbia. <laughs> And she campaigned to end the driving ban for women in Saudi Arabia, videotaping herself behind the wheel. It's unclear what charges she and the other activists will face, but the public prosecutor is working to put them on trial, connected to undermining security. Canada's former ambassador to Saudi Arabia met with some of the women last year, weeks before they were detained. Well, they're passionate about their country, they're passionate about change. That they would be involved in anything related to national security is, is, is ludicrous. It was Canada's foreign affairs minister calling for the immediate release of the activists that sparked a feud with Saudi Arabia. Are you still considered a persona non grata there? Yeah, and I think that'll likely be permanent. These things are very rarely lifted. Now forced to observe from afar, Dennis Horak explains what he expects in their trials. Uh, a conviction is very likely, probably, uh, 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 with, with quote-unquote confessions attached to them. It's the way the Saudi system works.
The activists were arrested just before the Saudi government ended the driving ban for women. This is about a ruler who wants to be seen as in control, not bowing to domestic pressure. It's a signal to other reformers and activists that through your activities, uh, don't think that reforms are going to happen. It's going to happen on my watch, my timeline, and so stay in line. People have raised concerns about the treatment of Al Hathloul and others behind bars. Her family has said that she has been subject to abuse, uh, verbal, psychological, and sexual harassment. Uh, others have reported that there have been uh, torture, that there have been bruise marks on their family uh, when they visited them. Human rights organizations have called for those allegations to be investigated and say the women should be released. Lorenda Radikoff, CBC News, Toronto. As we head to break, here are some snowy sights from around the city today. Some brave Torontonians making the most of the weather. Some of us, though, have had enough. So will this snowy weather stick around? Sophia is back with us after the break for your long-range weather forecast. About 250 young people gathered in Toronto today for the National Jack Summit. The topic? Mental health. 
not only do they care about mental health, they've educated themselves about it, and they're, they're doing a landscape scan of what's available uh, on their campuses, in their communities, and trying to really uh, say what's needed and what, what's, what's right for their uh, generation in terms of accessing services. Windler started the initiative after his son Jack died by suicide nine years ago. Today, guest speakers took to the stage in an effort to inspire youth in attendance. This is the seventh year for the summit. If you're always on the lookout for well-aged pieces, the Toronto Antique and Vintage Market is on this weekend. Clothing, kitchen wares and more are being sold by vendors of all ages. I'm looking for old vintage kids' cl uh, clothes and clothes that would make kids happy. Okay, so show me what. The seven year old wear. entrepreneur says she is the best dressed student in her grade two class. Her dad says antique shopping is oh, in yeah. their genes. The way we got our start is kind of unique. Uh, everything in our shop, my wife, her mother, her grandmother collected over 50 years, and now the fourth generation is this little firecracker here otherwise known as Lola, who sells vintage kids' clothing in her parents' store in downtown Hamilton. Her sales go directly to her college fund. CEO in training there. Okay, we're checking in with Sophia again for the long-range forecast and polar vortex is part of it, really? Yeah, again, <laughs> again. The question is, can Lola find a vintage winter jacket to mm. use over the next little while? Okay, I gotta clarify something, though. We talked about spring coming in 18 days. That doesn't necessarily mean the spring weather is gonna come. Our chances it'll roar in like a lion, not a lamb. This weekend, though? fairly seasonal, maybe a little bit below. Get out with the kids Sunday. Uh, play in the snow, you might have some light scattered flurries going because then this hits you on the head come Tuesday. We're about 10 degrees below seasonal. Tuesday, Wednesday, feeling about 20 degrees below seasonal with the wind. And it's not just the polar vortex and this dominating Arctic high pressure that we're gonna have to deal with this upcoming work week. Bands of lake effect snow and I wanna tell you about the possibility of a Colorado low that we're keeping a close eye on for next weekend. Uh, really early to talk about impact or track, but I mention it because it's the weekend before March break. Everybody might be you know, getting their travel plans on to try to head somewhere warm and sunny. So we'll keep an eye on that. We'll also keep an eye on this cold that is upcoming throughout the work week. Enjoy this weekend though, fairly seasonal but uh, don't let it fool you a little bit of winter weather as you can probably see still out your window coming down it'll continue into eastern uh, Ontario and into the Ottawa Valley if you're traveling out that way into the overnight period you could see a couple centimeters when it's all said and done but we really dodged a bullet as far as the Sunday system I mentioned uh, you'll see a grazing of a couple centimeters of snow in Niagara region if it was a little bit more north it would be a major winter snow story which is what they are seeing on the eastern seaboard. So there you go, we, we got out of one. Right, and we're yeah. pros at this major uh, winter snow thing. All hat. <laughs> Thanks, Sophia. You're welcome. Okay, so with a forecast like that, we all need a taste of spring, even if it is from the other side of the Pacific. Japan is embarking on a cherry blossom season, and that means lots of people are getting outdoors, snapping photos of this spectacle. So you enjoy it too, that's our show for you tonight. Thank you for watching. Have a great night, everyone.